When the night has come And the land is dark And the moon is the only night we'll see No, I won't be afraid Oh, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand Stand by Should tumble and fall, or the mountain should crumble to the sea. I won't cry, I won't cry, no, I won't shed a tear just as long as you stand, stand by me. Welcome this morning. Friends and family, we are gathered here today to pay our final tribute of respect to our dear loved one and friend, George Strait. To you, the members of the family who mourn your loss, we especially offer our deep and sincere sympathy. May we share with you the comfort afforded by God's word for such a time as this. Do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And then Jesus says to us in the Gospel of John, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this moment. We thank you for this gathering, this time together, Lord. Father, it is our prayer that as we've come to this place, it is our prayer that we would be able to honor and remember the love that we had for George. We pray, Father, that during this time you would minister to each person who has come, especially the family. Father, we pray that through our time together, our conversations, our stories, and our fellowship, that, that we might not just remember George, but that we would be 
more aware of your presence in our lives. So Father, we ask that you would just work through our time together, that you would be in the midst of everything that we do and that all that we would do would be for your glory and honor. We ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So why are we here this morning at the Roundhouse? Well, there is really no better place to honor George than by gathering here this morning. See, George played basketball here in this building. Now, he didn't play very well, but he played. He had fun. He tried. Uh, he used to sing on this stage. He probably got into trouble back on those very bleachers. So for those of you sitting back there, just watch yourselves. He played baseball out back on the diamond, and he was successful, so much so that he earned a scholarship to Upper Iowa. George used to eat in the cafeteria where we will be having lunch together later. By the way, while you're down there eating, check out the class of 1967. Uh, there's a great looking picture uh, of George. There's also a veterans memorial out front that has George's name on it. You see, many years ago, Lucille and Fred Cummins used to pick up George and his siblings and bring them into New Providence for Sunday school. That's where he learned about salvation. Jesus' love and his saving grace. George and Tammy bought their first house here in New Providence and had their two children here. So in many ways, George has now come full circle and is home again. New Providence definitely left an impression on George and helped shape him into the man he was. Now here this morning, George has left his impression with us. This time I'd like to ask Rick Bachman to come up and share uh, some thoughts and memories with us. I was going to use my notes. I kind of want to stick to the script because I could tell stories about George all day. And uh, the truth of it is, I'd have to check some of them to see if the statute of limitations has expired on a few of them. <laughs> George was a notoriously good driver, and I learned this the hard way when I first got started in the Old Or PD with him. As a young rookie, I hadn't been on probably more than a week. George had gone into the office and told me to go patrol, which was heady stuff for a young kid. And I got called back to the office code three, which means lights and siren. Well, I came back in a hurry, but not lights and siren. George instantly jumped in, turned both of them on, and yelled an address at me. Now, my adrenaline is going 100 mile an hour, and I am driving on these slick, wintry day, and I am trying to get to this address as fast as I can, with the siren pumping my adrenaline even harder than I should be. Needless to say, I went around a corner a little too fast, way too fast, and hit a snowbank. George is yelling at me, watch out for the snowbanks. My adrenaline pumping and just going, I, I am, I am. And he goes, you must, you hit it. <laughs> it wasn't the last time George would critique my driving skills. He was an extremely good driver. And George was one of those guys that just was always having a good time. And another wintry day, we went down to the airport. Now, the airport where a lot of George's stunts got taken place because it was out of the public eye and you could do things with a squad car that you shouldn't do with a squad car. And on this particular snowy, icy day, the, air, the runway was quite icy. And so we were down there cutting nuts, and, uh, which was fun. And George was driving, and that was back in the 70s when you know, remember the old revolving red lights? Well... Those revolving red lights, George decided that maybe he could keep the light stationary and revolve the car underneath. We spent a good half hour trying. <laughs> George was fun because he was always looking for something to do to trust his driving skills to push it a little harder. In fact, George is responsible for the shortest career in Eldora PD history. Eldora PD hired a young man put him on day shift with George, and they went out by the training school, and for some reason, I don't, George never did explain to me, I wasn't there, he just related this story, 
he committed a what's called a J-turn, which means at 50 mile an hour, you lock up the brakes, crank the wheel, and turn around at 50 mile an hour going the opposite way. Now, whether it was to chase somebody down, just to show the rookie how it's done, I don't know. But as soon as they were finished, the rookie says, take me back to the office. Took his badge, his gun off, and says, that's it, I quit. <laughs> this was more excitement than he could handle. That's the kind of driving George did. And George was extremely good at driving. Uh, back of the days when the fairgrounds was the racetrack had not been rebuilt yet this is way back in the 70s it was weeded up and rutted and everything else we found a way on I shouldn't say we George found a way onto the racetrack and we were driving around this racetrack knocking weeds down hitting the ruts and trying to go as fast as he could around this track finally after getting up the speed and the most of the weeds down so we could go quite fast he thought I think I can get this car up on two wheels. Now I know George. If he thinks it, he will do it. I spent the next two laps pleading with him, no, no, no. <laughs> we finally talked him out of it. I don't know how, but we did not ever try the two wheel stunt. And I quite frankly am thrilled by that fact. George's sense of humor was hilarious. Back in the early 70s, we had a 8-track player. Most of you are not old enough to know what an 8-track player is, but those of you do knew that they weren't very common. But the squad car, we decided to all pitch our money together and get an 8-track player. And one 4 to 12 shift, me and George were riding, and he had the 8-track player going, and he had some old Dr. Demento type 8-track that had some of these weird songs. One of which was, I think, called I'm a Nut. And it's basically going, I'm a nut, I'm a nut, I'm a nut. And George kind of liked this song. Windows are rolled down. He cranks the music up and starts singing along. He looks over and I'm slouched down trying to hide as we're riding through residential areas. And the more he realized it was embarrassing me, the louder the music got, the louder the singing got. You had to appreciate George's honesty with himself. He was a nut, and he appreciated it, and he embellished it. He was fun, but he was also probably one of the best drivers in Hardin County. We always had to test out the new squad cars whenever we got them, and we'd always try them out without the light bar and with the light bar just to see how much that knocked off. And one particular time, again, I was not there on this one, but I got it related to me by Galen. They were coming back through Pine Lake, and this was before the dam had been rebuilt. And it was a very narrow bridge across that old dam, for those of you who remember. Well, they were going a little faster than perhaps they should have been, because the squad car started sliding sideways. And they're coming through this dam sideways when they see an approaching car. And Galen screaming, turn the lights on, turn the lights on, make it look official. <laughs> of course, George was doing everything he could do to keep it from hitting both sides of the dam. That was George. He could drive it faster than he could drive. There was another time that was often, we would find ourselves following people of ill repute and trying to find cases. We were notorious. In fact, we were more than famous. We were infamous for being a little hardcore police department. And George had by this time gone to the sheriff's office and Galen and me and I don't remember who else was in the city squad car followed a group of folks that looked like they were into some drug activity. And we followed them out on a gravel road without lights on to about two or three miles out of town. And we called George because we knew we were out of our jurisdiction and whatever was gonna take place had to be George's deal, not ours. So we're talking back on the radios, back and forth, where are you at, where you got, you know, where, you know, go down this road, come down this, and we're sitting there in the gravel road with the lights off, watching this group of people, and about that time, I said, Galen, maybe you should hit the brake lights so George doesn't rear us. Galen scoffed, he said, George and I have done this a thousand times, we're professionals, we know what we're doing, don't worry about it. Well, at about this time, George is on the radio, asking, where are you at for sure? Where are you at? And we were just over the crest of a hill. Both of the mics were keyed, 
when I heard Galen, Galen yell, whoa, 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 <laughs> and I could hear George going, shit, shit, shit. <laughs> When we finally got it all separated, the first half of George's brazer by the squeal of track or the skid tracks was midway among the squad car. But George split the brakes, Galen hit the gas, and we managed to miss each other. But for some of you who may remember an old fellow named Russ Gast, the dispatcher that used to work up there, he was listening in the sheriff's office and there was very little that shook up Russ. But Russ just calmly, after all this went over the radio, said, Will that be one wrecker or two, gentlemen? <laughs> <laughs> you just never knew with George. I have feared for my life with George more than once in a squad car. And yet, I don't think there was another man that I would have put my life in their hands more readily than George's. He was a pleasure to work with. He was an instrument in changing my life a large degree when I was a child and growing up. So I really do appreciate sharing these memories of him and this chance to remember him so fondly. Thank you, Rick, for sharing that, those stories. And I'm sure there are many more that you could have, like you said, continued on for the rest of the day, for sure. Well, I want to take a moment to recognize uh, a, a few folks, um, because George spent the last seven months of his life under the professional care of the staff at Ullery No. 3 at the Iowa Veterans Home. The staff there undergoes special training and education to care for all the types of dementia patients. It's their job, and most of them do it very well, but there are exceptions. Some staff go way beyond their duties and way beyond just a job. So some of the staff connected with George and dealt with his every need, physically, mentally, emotionally. They supported his family. They offered encouragement. They cried together, laughed together, and they went through the end of this journey together. I think we have at least one staff member here. I don't know if they'll raise their hand or not, but uh, the family would like you to know that. Um, a thank you doesn't seem like enough to someone who has done so much. You have made the darkest days seem brighter and our burden easier to carry. Words cannot express the love and inspiration you have given us. We offer this prayer for you as you continue to care for residents. And this is the prayer the family would like to share. May you have grace under fire, strength when you are weary, wisdom to know to care for yourself, and the continued ability to touch with love the lives of those you care for. Um, I'd like for us to just recognize them with an applause, if we could, for a moment. Alzheimer's is much more than losing your memory. It eventually took George's ability to speak, to walk, and to swallow. But long before that, Alzheimer's also took away his dignity, his ability to be productive, to reason, and he knew it. It was immensely frustrating for George to not be able to do what he used to do. I I'm sure there were moments when he wished he could be back in that car doing those kind of things that he used to do. So George would try and hide it. He would smile and joke and pretend he knew who you were. But tears of hurt and deep sadness would flood out at home. If you are caring for someone with dementia or even just visiting someone with dementia, Tammy recommends watching Tipa Snow videos on YouTube. Uh, her name is Tipa Snow. She trains people how to interact with and care for dementia patients. It's not easy, but it can be a blessing. George said he felt like he was sinking into the sunset and wasn't going to find his way back. But for every sunset, there is a sunrise. The sun has risen in George's life. His physical struggle is over. But there was another struggle that George had overcome. You see, George was no different than any of us here this morning. All of us struggle with different things in our lives. 
the root of that struggle is often our own selfishness. Our selfishness can lead us into sin and darkness and places we never intended to go. The question is, are we going to live for ourselves, always trying to find happiness in things and in other people, or are we going to surrender our life to God? George loved to work. He was a hardworking man and he provided well for his family. He was dependable. You could count on him. Even on some of those calls, you could still count on him. But when it came to his own mortality, there was nothing he could do to overcome what was happening to him. George's struggle reminds all of us how fragile life is. I'd like to read a few words from the Apostle Paul. Um, it's found in the New Testament in the Bible in 2 Corinthians, and this is chapter 5. Paul writes, For we know that if the earthly tent, this body that we live in, we know that if it is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. Meanwhile, as we're here, we, we groan, longing to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, because when we are clothed, we will not be found naked. This, this is our hope. For while we are in this tent, this body, we groan and are burdened because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that which is mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now the one who has fashioned us for this very purpose is God. God is the one who has given us his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due us for all the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. As much as George loved to work and do his own thing, he reached a point in life where he knew that there was something that he could not accomplish on his own. George could not save himself. He could not undo the sin and the mistakes in his life. For that, George needed a savior. And in this, George was like all of us here this morning. We all need a savior. We all need Jesus. Jesus is the only one who can save us. It is through his life, death, and resurrection that, uh, of Jesus that we can find new life. A life that outlasts this life here on earth. A, a life that extends into all of eternity. It's the life that George is now enjoying. This life doesn't come by works. It doesn't come by living a perfect life. And certainly George was not perfect, just as you and I are not perfect. But there is hope for each one of us. There is an eternal life of freedom, a life of hope that only comes by believing that Jesus Christ is Lord. So that joy, George discovered it. He discovered that he didn't have to wait for God. He recognized and discovered that, that God was already waiting for him. So George reached a point in his life where he prayed a prayer of repentance. He declared with his mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and he made Jesus Lord of his life. And in that moment, George received his new life. Now pain and difficulty still came in George's life, but his hope never left. So George won more than the battle over Alzheimer's. He won the battle of eternal salvation. Often in obituaries, we say that someone lost the battle. Well, George won the battle. When George's body died, the disease died too. But George's spiritual body goes on to live forever in the next life we call heaven. George is forever free. And he can know and experience the love of Jesus forevermore. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this, you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by the fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy, for you are receiving the end result of your faith the salvation of your souls.
from 1 Peter chapter 1. George has received that reward. I'd like for us to bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this reminder from your word. And we're so thankful, Father, that George reached a moment in his life when he recognized that there was a higher power. He recognized that there was a creator. Not only that there was a creator, but a God in heaven who loved him and who was present and waiting for him with arms wide open. I'm so thankful that George made that decision to make Jesus Lord of his life. Although George didn't get everything right, he is just like each one of us here. We all have our imperfections, we all have our past, but we're so thankful that in Jesus Christ we have a future. So Father, I just pray for each one of us and the families that have gathered in this place, that before we leave this, this space, that we would pause ourselves to reflect on our own journey, our own life up to this point. Father, I pray just through the presence of your Holy Spirit that you would speak into our lives, reminding us of the love that you have for us, reminding us of your son Jesus, that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross and through his death and resurrection, we can now have life. Not just life now, but life eternal. We're so thankful, Father, for that hope and it is that hope that we cling to and it is that promise that we are holding on to this morning as we think of George. So Father, bless those who have gathered. We ask and we pray this morning in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, at this time, the family would like for us to sit and listen and reflect to the song, Who You Say I Am, by Hillsong. Just stay. 
Praise God, George is free. Amen. Well, earlier this morning, the family gathered at the cemetery for a private ceremony. And George was laid to rest at Honey Creek Cemetery, just south of here in New Providence. In a moment, we'd like to invite you to join us outside for military honors that will be presented by American Legion Post 182. So you are welcome to make your way out after the family departs uh, to partake in that, or if you don't want to go outside, you're welcome to make your way downstairs to the cafeteria. And uh, I was thinking, because this was a school, school that George attended, um, let's just remember that we don't have to run in line. We don't have to be first to get down there. There'll be plenty of food, and the family does invite you to join them uh, for that meal as well. But at this time, we're going to invite the family to stand, and we'll make our way outside. Tell us about the blood, sweat, and tears that it offers. God forgive us. 